my pleasure to introduce today Leslie Lamport. He's got a one collection of stuff on the desk here, so I'm excited to know what it's, what it's going to be about. I'm curious myself. Uh, never tried talking about this subject, so. Uh, Okay, um, last week you heard about how to become a millionaire writing books, uh, so uh, I'm not going to tell you anything about books. Uh, I haven't written enough to, uh, to know too much about it. So instead I'm going to be, what I say will be mostly about things like journal articles, conference papers, or technical reports, or letters to your friends, or... Uh, <laughs> things that are less ambitious than books. And particular, I actually, journal articles and conference proceedings, those are the sorts of things that I think people here are most likely to be writing and to want to make uh, good. Uh, and I have uh, one simple piece of advice about writing a paper for publication. Don't. Uh, scores of papers have been written. I mean, there are hundreds of them flooding the journals. Most of them aren't very interesting. They're pretty dull and well-written and not well-written. And why should you add one more to, to this pile of, of uh, the detritus of computer science? Well, uh, I guess uh, I don't really mean that completely seriously. I'm an editor of a couple of, on, on the editorial board of a couple of journals, and I mean, what would we do if everybody stopped writing papers, and uh, no one wrote papers, there would be no reason to have conferences, and I wouldn't get to go and see all my friends, so somebody has to write papers, and uh, I suppose you might as well do it as the next guy, but it's not a facetious question, it's not a completely facetious statement. Um, whenever you think about writing a paper, you should really ask yourself, why? Is this paper worth writing? Or is it just going to be some you know, other bunch of uh, you know, a few trees cut down in vain for uh, the uh, generation of scads of uh, laser printer output? So why should you write a paper? Well, there are lots of bad reasons for writing papers. Um, unfortunately, in academia, one of the reasons is that you want a nice long publication list and you want to be able to write dozens and dozens of published papers and conference proceedings. And, uh, it's very hard for me to say that you shouldn't do that, uh, but you shouldn't. Uh, I would like to think that tenure committees pay attention not to the, the weight of uh, the stack of, of papers that you've published, but to the quality. And I would like to think that Publishing one good paper will do you more good than publishing three or four mediocre ones. Uh, I'm not sure if that's in fact the case. I don't know how tenure committees work. Fortunately, I've never had to go up before one. But if I can argue against that for uh, practical reasons, um, I will argue for it in terms of your own integrity you should not want to publish anything that you don't feel is worth publishing. And uh, your academic department's uh, reasons for telling you to do otherwise should not uh, change uh, your mind about something that fundamental. Another bad reason for doing it is, for writing a paper, is that there's this conference coming up and you know I've got to have a paper in this conference. And, uh, I'm rather mystified by the fact that I see uh, certain conferences that come around every year and there are certain computer scientists who have a paper in that conference every year. And I don't know how they do it. I mean, maybe they have, uh, you know, just so brimming, uh, brimful of, of great ideas that when the deadline comes around, they always have this gem of a paper that they, they want to submit. Uh, I'm afraid that more often it's the fact that, you know, 
oh my god, conference X is coming around. What am I going to submit to this? You know, let's see, what have I done? That, you know, anything I can call a theorem and put into a paper. And uh, even worse, uh, oh, conference X deadline is coming around. There's this paper that I wanted to write. Let me you know, rush through it and, and uh, you know, it's not going to come out very good, but uh, at least I'll get it in on the deadline and maybe when the time for the revision comes around, I will, it'll, you know, I'll fix it up. But, Somehow, if the paper does get accepted, when the time that the revised version is uh, due, that you know, they have all these other things to happen, and, you know, are also due, and so uh, a rather sloppy paper tends to get into the conference proceedings. Uh, I've seen this happen. I've seen papers with incorrect results um, that the authors knew were incorrect that have been published in the proceedings because the authors did not do it right the first time and did not have time to, uh, to get it right. Uh, one recent conference, the authors are, uh, have promised to send to each of the participants uh, a copy of the correct version of the paper. Now, you do not want to put yourself in a position like that. Because just imagine what all of those conference attendees think about the person who has to send them a revised, corrected version of the paper that uh, is in the conference proceedings. So those are a couple of bad reasons for uh, writing a paper. What are the good reasons? Well, there's one good reason. And that is you have done something that you are excited about. And you are so excited about this, and you think that this is so neat that you have got to tell the world about it. And that is the one good reason for writing a paper. And every time you think about writing a paper, uh, and even that you'll think that's a wonderful idea you have, and you'll write a paper, and even then you still have to ask yourself, is this worth publishing? Someone once said that, uh, you should judge an artist not by the quality of what's hanging framed on his walls, but by the quality of what's in his wastebasket. That's something worth remembering. Let people judge you not in terms of, you know, what is the best thing that you've ever managed to somehow write, but what is the worst thing that you consider worthy of publication. Well, Don has uh, assumed the monumental task of trying to teach you about writing. And I don't know how much I can help him in this uh, task. Um, writing isn't a skill like typing. And typing is something you do that you know you, know you have to you know, sit in front of a typing book for 47 hours, you know, e, 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 g, g, g. And after that, you'll know how to type. And you'll, uh, depending on how coordinated you are, you'll be able to do you know, from 30 to 150 words a minute or something. Um, writing isn't like that. Writing's not a skill, it's an art. One can teach the technique of writing, but that's not enough. It's sort of like piano playing. Um, you have to learn the technique, you have to be able to hit the right notes for playing the piano, but uh, just being able to hit the right notes doesn't put you on the stage of Carnegie Hall. Uh, there's a lot more. Uh, pianists don't just study the techniques. They don't just play scales. They study music. Uh, a friend of mine who's a concert pianist said that he spends much more time away from the piano studying the music than he does sitting at the piano practicing it. So good writing is an art. Good writing requires good thinking. I don't know how to separate out the, uh, the writing process from the thinking process. Because bad writing very often comes from bad thinking. And it's certainly the case that bad thinking can never produce good writing. So where do you start? Um, you decide you want to write something. Well, as I indicated, the first thing is you have to have something to say. And it's very important to be clear in your mind about what it is it you want to say and to whom. Um, is this going to be a paper about some uh, 
extension to Frisbee's theory. Uh, fine, it's a paper about the extension to Frisbee's, Frisbee's theory. And your goal is to tell the reader about this extension to Frisbee's theory. You also want to decide who you're writing this paper for. Is this paper for um, five or six people who, you know, Mr. Frisbee and, and the five or six of his graduate students who are interested in his theory? That's fine. Uh, if, you, if that's the case, then you can write a paper assuming that your reader knows all about Frisbee's theory. Uh, you're likely to uh, not try to submit it to a journal. You might just send it in a letter to, to Frisbee and copy his graduate students, or more likely you'll write it as a technical report. And there might be some specialized conference where there are, you know, that 100 people will attend, and um, including Frisbee and his students, and he's published his paper in that conference, and maybe some of those people are interested enough in his theory that you know, they'd be like to hear about the extension. So then your audience might be 100 people. Or on the other hand, if you're writing a, uh, you might be writing a general article on how Frisbee's theory is going to solve the software production problem. Now, this is an article for Datamation reaching 47,000 readers. And um, then it's not just for Frisbee and his six graduate students. And you'll have to write the paper. You'll have to think about the paper in a completely different way. So your thinking has to be very clear about the purpose of this paper. Is it presenting the technical results, giving all the formalism, all the details, dotting all the I's? Or is this a, a general paper for a survey paper or for you know, the datamation audience who, you know, who wants to know um, how many thousands of dollars they can save if they get their uh, employees to go and study with uh, Professor Frisbee and uh, his uh, disciples? Now, most of the papers you'll write will be about some fairly solid idea, uh, a theorem that you've discovered. Um, but the idea isn't always that solid, uh, but it still has to be well defined. Um, I wrote a paper once called The Whore Logic of CSP. And the thing that got that paper started was the title. And let me explain the title. Uh, there's this uh, type of logic called Whore Logic, which of course was invented by Tony Hoare. And then there's this uh, programming language called CSP, which was also invented by Tony Hoare. And the, but when Tony Hoare goes about reasoning about CSP programs, he doesn't use Hoare logic. So I thought the idea of writing a paper called the Hoare logic of CSP was very clever. And that was a fine reason to start writing a paper. But um, that's not the only reason. The purpose of the paper was just not a joke. The purpose of the paper was that I was trying to show something, in particular to show that Hoare logic could be applied to this domain as well. So of course, it was a paper about Hoare logic. Uh, but it had not only a catchy title, but um, there's something that modern English doesn't really have a word for, but I think the Elizabethans used to call it a conceit, uh, the closest I, word I can think of is, is a gimmick. Um, this is something around which you can, you can wrap the paper. Now, um, a paper about the wonders of, of Hoare logic uh, would tend to be rather, um, if I sort of thought in the abstract about a paper about um, you know, the, the wonders of Hoare logic and how it's good for all these, these amazing things, uh, it's very hard to to, to get a grasp on, on that kind of paper, to, to see just where to begin, where you dig in. Um, but when I had this focus, this idea of Hoare logic applied to CSP, well, this is a one particular application. But the nature of the application would tell the reader that Hoare logic is not just good for CSP. It's good for lots of other things that, you, that the reader may not have thought it was good for. And so, by using this conceit, I was able to, to get a start on the paper, to be able to get something I could grab hold of, and that sort of determined the course of the paper. Now, this particular conceit is, uh, is an example of the value of examples. 
it's much easier it's much better to if you can do it instead of to write a dry abstract paper on your extension to frisbee's theory to come up with one solid nice example and start with that example and base your paper about around that example the reader is going to care a lot more about your extension to frisbee's theory if he sees this marvelous program that you can apply it to and it does wonderful things on this example and then say hey yeah this is interesting you know what's real what's the general case of what's going on and then you know chapter 2 or something you hit him with the general theorem of that's behind your your method and then he's going to be interested um, also examples are, are wonderful in that they keep you honest and they really will uh, allow you to uh, to discover what's going on um, so I find myself talking not about writing but about doing computer science here but uh, as I said I don't think you can separate the two um, you can't separate writing from thinking and the best way I find for, uh, to to think about things is in terms of examples. Just, uh, just this week, um, I was rewriting a paper and realized that um, paper wasn't very satisfactory because it was too abstract. I thought I could get away with a nice short paper that did the abstraction and the, the applications of this would be so obvious that uh, you know, no need to include the examples. Well, one of the comments that I got back from someone who I, who I had sent the paper to was, gee, this is very interesting. Are there any real programs that it applies to? <laughs> and I said, oh my god, you know, here's this thing that I thought it was obvious how it would radically improve the way of dealing with one whole large class of programs. And he didn't see it. So um, I started in and decided the way I would rewrite it is to pick a particular example. And I chose what seemed like a the simplest example I could take. And it's never a mistake to choose too simple an example. You, you can't do it. Uh, the, uh, well, maybe you can. Uh, you certainly can't choose too simple an example if you're talking about your result. If you're giving a lecture, it's impossible to choose too simple an example for a lecture. It may be possible to choose too simple an example for a, a paper. Anyway, I chose this example and I started working it out. And what I realized is that this wonderful theorem that I had proved was not quite strong enough to deal with this example. And in fact, what I needed to do was a very simple generalization of the theorem. It was trivial, but uh, what it seemed like perfectly obvious abstraction to me was, was not so obvious uh, and not so good when it came to a real example. Uh, and I certainly should have known better. Um, the first, uh, I don't know how many years of, of my computer science career, um, all I did was play with examples. It was known as publishing algorithms. But uh, I think you know, whatever success I may have had comes from the fact that um, I always started with examples and worked into general theory afterwards. And um, was always willing to abandon theory when the examples uh, when it didn't work on the examples. Anyway, um, a conceit is a nice thing to, to have, uh, to uh, a way of getting started. But beware of it. Um, be prepared to abandon your original goal. Uh, novelists always say that they start writing this novel and, and they had uh, an idea of exactly what was going to happen, but suddenly the characters weren't cooperating. They started doing things by themselves. Uh, and that the novel turned out with a completely different ending than they had intended. Well, uh, that's not just in, in writing novels. I find the same thing happens in, in writing papers. Sometimes uh, a theorem can develop a life of its own. I mean, I think that the paper is going to be about one thing, but as I'm writing it, the material itself just tells me that, no, it's not about that. It's about this something else that's more interesting. And um, I may just change the direction of the paper. More likely, I will just abandon the original conceit. I will say that, well, this example, this particular way of looking at things is really neat. 
uh, and then I'll write the paper and I'll suddenly find that it's getting harder and harder to write. And what I discover is that instead of the conceit helping me, I find myself fighting against it. So it could very well have happened that as I was writing this paper on the whore logic of CSP, um, it could have turned into something completely different. It could have decided that CSP didn't work as well for CSP as for something else. And I could have completely, I might have found myself completely abandoning um, that idea. Uh, it didn't happen. What did happen is that um, it turned in, I got myself a co-author, and it turned into the whore logic of CSP and all that. Because my co-author convinced me that if I just did it for CSP, well, people might not get the idea that this is good for lots of other things. So he suggested, well, why don't we do it in addition to CSP to uh, so this other area? And I realized he was right. And so the original conceit was, in some sense, diluted, uh, uh, diluted. But very often, the original conceit gets uh, completely thrown out the, the window. Um, another thing to be aware of is cute. Um, conceits tend to come very dangerously close to cuteness. And cuteness sounds great uh, the first time you're, you're doing it, but uh, if anybody ever reads it, you know, the second time or the third time, it starts getting awfully stale. Uh, one example of cuteness is jokes. I noticed that Don gave some advice about jokes. Um, I think that's probably good advice in writing a book. You know, the reader is going to be living with this book for quite a while, and uh, having something to lighten it up may help. Uh, it's rarely a good idea in a journal paper or in a conference proceedings. Uh, jokes that you think are hilarious today, 10 years, you're going to be looked back on it and say, my god, did I really think that was funny? <laughs> um, anyway, the, the most important thing, and I will repeat it continually today, is that you have to find what you're saying to be exciting. You have to want to really write this paper. Where should you publish it? Well, what are the choices? Probably you, as a journal, you might submit it to a journal, you might submit it to a conference, you might just issue it as a technical report for send to 50 of your closest friends, or you might consign it to the wastebasket. Don't take me literally about the wastebasket, I should really say the bottom drawer. Never throw it in the wastebasket. You may decide later that there were some good ideas in there, or else you want to have that for, uh, just for historical reasons, to figure out how did I ever get from point A to point B in my career. Uh, there are, unfortunately, a number of papers of mine that uh, were literally in the wastebasket, and I would love to, to see them again, even though I'm glad they were never published. Um, now, the how do you decide where to send something? Generally, a journal sh article should be something that's polished, something that is in final form, something you think is, is really, um, you're not going to change your mind in six months or a year and decide you should have done it uh, somewhat differently. Uh, conference paper tends to be something that may be more, uh, a little rougher. You think this is a neat idea, you want to show people, but maybe it's not really ready for, for the archives. Maybe you'd like to get some reaction to it. Maybe you think that uh, something that you'd like to get out quickly so that you know, the one or two or three or 400 people at this conference can look at it and um, get some reaction to it and then uh, take your time in deciding whether, you know, what its final form should be. You may decide that it's not really ready to go out into the, uh, the, the, the cold world of publication and just issue it as a technical report. Usually if you're at some institution, there'll be some mechanism for, uh, for writing, uh, uh, for publishing things as Stanford technical report number 4793 or whatever. And it gets a, uh, depending on the institution, it can have a, a wide distribution or uh, not so wide. When does this end? Two o'clock. Two or five. Um, anyway, you have to be objective in deciding where it goes. Um, and you have to really be uh, hard on yourself. 
and make sure that if this really belongs in the waste basket, that's where it goes. But you shouldn't change the, you shouldn't say just because this is a technical report, I'm not going to spend so much time writing it. You still have readers. And you still want to do a good job of writing. And that technical report, you hope, will someday become a, a journal article. So anything that I will say about writing applies just as well to uh, technical reports as it does to journal articles. Um, Don's been talking a lot about what I would call the low-level structure of, of writing. Individual sentences, and, uh, commas, and semicolons, and, and all of that. Um, that's very important. That's part of the craft. But watch out for, avoid the problem of local optimization. You work very hard on this sentence when the problem isn't with the sentence, but it's with the whole paragraph that it's in. Or this paragraph isn't working right, not because there's something wrong with the paragraph, but because there's something wrong with the whole organization of the section. Uh, most of the time when I find that there's something wrong with the sentence that I write, the correction has to be in, in the paragraph, not within the sentence itself. Um, so what can I say about this larger structure? Um, not much, especially since I'm here. Example. I'd like to show you something. Here we have a proposition, proposition LXXXII, theorem XLI from Newton's Principia. Um, in a sphere described about the center S with radius SA, if there be taken SI, SA, SP, continually proportional, I say, I love that I say, I wish people did that uh, these days, I say that the attraction of a corpuscle within a sphere in any place I is to its attraction without the sphere in the place P in a ratio compounded of the square root of the ratio of I, S, P, S, the distances from the center, and the square root of the ratio of the centripetal forces, blah, blah. It looks rather weird. It's hard to read. Why is it hard to read? It's hard to read because there aren't any formulas in there. It's talking about the square root, the ratio of the square root of one ratio to the square root of another weight ratio, but not writing any formulas down. Um, one of the great advances in, in mathematical writing has been the, introduce, the introduction of a lot of notation for representing formulas, square roots, uh, integral signs, and you know, all that whole business that we love to traipse out and, and impress our friends with by using tech to typeset. Uh, now, Newton's uh, statement of the proposition, it sort of reads like he was writing a novel. Well, modern mathematics has made great strides, right? Oh, let's look at this statement. And let's look at this proof. And we frame in um, on this portion. A, we have a theorem and a proof. Don't try to read it but just try to look at it. It's got a lot of notation. It has um, a lot of formulas. But except for those formulas, I mean, it reads like the great American novel. It's written as a structure in paragraphs. You know, let us be first order, blah, 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 and let the argument above. This is this nice prose st statement, exactly what Isaac Newton was writing in uh, the 17th century. Um, well, what can be done about that? Um, as a matter of fact, the only advance beyond the level of the formula in terms of how, what kind of notation we have for writing mathematics is the displayed numbered equation, which gives us a way of, of referring back to uh, some previous material. Well, I don't know what can be done, but they have one notion. Let's uh, start with this... Uh, Little, propo uh, little proposition and, and theorem. Um, it's in the handout that I just gave you. Um, it uh, was borrowed from uh, Spivak's calculus book. And the book was open in front of me when I did this, so I have to tell you that. Uh, and it's a simple theorem. Uh, it's, uh, I forget what this is called. Uh, Something about the derivative is greater than zero for all x in an interval, then f is increasing on the interval. And the proof is they let a and b be two points in the interval, blah, 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 blah. Okay? 
What I've done down here is take this exact same proof and wrote it in the format you used in plane geometry. Statement, reason, statement, reason, etc. Now, I claim that that is a lot easier to understand than the same proof written in the paragraph form. Moreover, a funny thing happened when I wrote this proof in the paragraph form. I wrote this down and I started putting in reasons and I noticed that some of the reasons weren't in the original proof, in the, in the, the uh, paragraph form proof. And so um, I had to go back to, to make them comparable. I went back and put in some extra explanation in the original proof and I think I got a, a better proof even in the paragraph form. Now, what can you learn from this one example? Well, uh, I don't know. First of all, I'm not talking about formatting. What's important is not that there are two columns and numbers on the left and, and all of that stuff. What's important is there's a structure there that I'm indicating. A structure of statement reason, statement reason, a nice way of referring back to previous statements. In, in the reasons, because I've given them all numbers. And this is a great format. It worked well for you in plane geometry. It's not ideal. It's not flexible enough. If you look at the structure of mathematical proofs, they tend to not be in a nice straight line, but you'll have restatement three, and then they'll go through a whole bunch of, of subsidiary steps in proving statement three before really working, moving on to statement four. So you have to... Uh, so, so this form isn't particularly good uh, in general. But what I want to do with this is to get you thinking about non-standard non ways of exposition. To think in terms of what is the logical structure of what you're doing. And when you're writing, think about that logical structure. And Write your proofs out in, whatever, in, in a manner, maybe statement, reason, statement, reason, even if just for your own use. Maybe you'll discover some better way of organizing uh, the proof so it will be more understandable to people. Um, it'll certainly help clarify your own thinking about it. I wish I could come out with this wonderful suggestion uh, for what you should do, but uh, I really don't. Um, I hope to work with Mary Claire on it uh, and see if we can come up with something more than one little example, but um, I don't know. It's a very difficult problem, and I just like people to start thinking about it. What I would not like you to start thinking about is formatting. Whenever you're writing, don't format. Um, the uh, I seem to have lost uh, my notes. Well. <laughs> uh, I will throw away my prepared speech. <laughs> uh, I've observed people waste enormous amount of time in formatting. And one advice is never format while you're writing a paper. Now, what does formatting mean? What is very good when you're writing a paper is to worry about logical structure. Sections, this is a section, this is a list. That's a logical concept. Formatting is things like there should be some space here, or this should be in two columns. Whenever you find yourself thinking about formatting in, in, as you're writing, it's a bad sign. If you're getting to some point in your writing and say, oh, I need a space here, that's a sign that there's something wrong with your writing because space is a formatting concept. It's not a logical concept. One thing that is good about uh, formatting programs is they have macros. Macros are wonderful. Use them as much as you can. Whenever you have a piece of notation, don't write it out. Write a macro for it. It gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of deciding eventually to, to change your notation. It helps you think in terms of what are the concepts for which I need a notation. So macros are wonderful. Um, uh, systems like Scribe, and Tech, and TROF, uh, by giving you macros, they've almost made up for uh, what they've done by encouraging people to uh, to do formatting while they're writing. Uh, 
Okay, the last thing I'd sort of like to talk about is, is writing itself, uh, the, the art of writing. And the thing I want to say again is you should be excited about what you're writing, which means that that excitement should appear in your writing and in the way you write. Now, I wanted to come up with some bad examples and pick some random books from my bookshelf, and it wasn't very hard. Um, let me take a look at this sentence. Uh, get down here. It says, um, the proof of this program is most under easily understood by considering, as always, the global invariant first. <laughs> Mary Claire is, is, is shaking her head there, and as well she should. What is it about that sentence? That sentence is just dull. That sentence is, uh, is just written by somebody who didn't seem to care what he was writing. It turns out this sentence can be improved, considerably improved in almost trivial fashion. I mean, what, what's wrong is that there's this as always that is just sort of stuck in there. And there is this global invariant first, which just sort of <laughs> dies out at the end. Um, simple matter we can say that, as always, um, the proof of this program is most easily understood uh, by first considering the global invariant. Now, just a couple of changings of words will just change the cadence of the, of the sentence, the way it, it flows. And just instead of, you know, like, it's a sentence that has some life. And how do you learn this? Well, you learn it by reading. And you don't learn it by reading mathematicians. I mean, Halmos and Knuth, I mean, they're good writers, but they're just not in the league uh, with people like T.S. Eliot and Dickens and John Fowles and, and people like that. And that's who you should be reading if you want to learn how to write. I mean, just pick up some random uh, sentence from T.S. Eliot. OK, <laughs> just totally random. Uh, where are we? I'm trying to find something that begins a sentence. So here I am in the middle way, having had 20 years. 20 years largely wasted. The years of, and there's, just see, this is a sentence, that this is a sentence that is, that is vibrant, that's alive. Now, it's probably, you say, it's not fair to, to look at, uh, to take a sentence from the middle of a technical paper and compare it with poetry because, you know, technical stuff I mean, it may be exciting, but it's somehow not as exciting as, you know, the meaning of life and, and uh, things like that. But so I decided, well, what should we look at? Well, let's look at the first sentence of a paper because that's someplace where you really, anybody who has any sense is trying to grab the reader. And you haven't gotten to the point of getting into all the technical nonsense, so the reader, you know, so you can't use that as an excuse. So what I did is I grabbed the latest issue of uh, Science of Computer Programming and looked at some first sentences. And what do we see? The motivation for this work is the similarity between a correctness property of a program and a property of its worst case computation time. Well, in some sense, that's, that's not terrible. It gets right to the point. I like that. But it's not a very strong sentence. The motivation for this work is the similarity between. Think of how much stronger that would be if you said something like um, correctness properties of program and properties of its worst case computation time are very similar. Positive statement. It's saying, ah, hey, there's something you're telling him. Not this paper, motivation for this paper, but bang, you start out with a statement. And the reader catches the reader's attention. Oh, let's go. Termination is central in programming and in particular in term rewriting systems. In programming and in particular in. I mean, how can somebody with an ear for language do that? <laughs> well, maybe that's an excuse uh, for the TV audience. Don said the guy is from France. Um, what else? I'm, I'm running short on time. Um, 
the starting point for the development of a program is an intuition. How about program development starts with an intuition? You want something that comes out. I mean, something you want to think. You want, you're excited about this paper. And you want that excitement to, to be evident to the reader. And it's not just technical stuff. Here's you know, Handbook for Scholars by Mary Claire Van Lunen. Something everybody should go out and buy just to, for the joy of reading it, even if you. <laughs> A random sentence. Write your references while the material is before you and while the archivist is by your side. Simple, direct, none of this, you know, it is important that you, uh, or any of this kind of uh, waffling. Um, I mean, Mary Claire gets excited about semicolons and she can make you excited about semicolons. And if Mary Claire can make you excited about semicolons, can you make the reader excited about something that you are really excited about? Um, just look at some, read some good first sentences. I mean, T.S. Eliot, Four Quartets. Um, time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future, and time future contained in time past. This is a sentence, this tells you what's coming in this whole book of poetry. It is lyrical as well as direct, straightforward. Um, Howell, Allen Ginsberg. Uh, I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness. I mean, there's something that comes and hits you in the gut. Um, and that's what you should do with your first sentence. You should hit the reader in the gut. Well, the second sentence is just as important. I mean, that's coming right after the second sentence. And you know, you're going to want to make that really strong too. OK? Well, when you get to the third sentence, you're not going to let the reader down, are you? I mean, you've got these two solid sentences right before it. So you've got to, and when you get to sentence 2,479, you've got to still keep socking it to him. You've got to care about your writing. Uh, well, this idea of looking at, at first sentences um, was something that just came to me yesterday. I was uh, getting ready for this. And I decided to see how I had done. Um, now, I had never before really thought about consciously about the notion that I should make a first sentence to, to be a grabber. And so I went back and, and looked, I uh, just grabbed all of the SRC reports from uh, my shelf and uh, all of my reports and, and went back through them and see how I did. So here we have synchronizing time servers. A time server provides the current time to its users. That is lovely, I think, <laughs> if I do say so myself. Straight to the point. And moreover, Notice the quotes around current time. If I would said a time service provides the current time to its users, the reader might have said, oh, really? What's this current time? What's that? That's, that doesn't make any sense to me. By like putting it in quotes, I told the reader, here's some word that you shouldn't take, you know, don't worry quite yet about what this means. This is, quote, current time. You're not supposed to, uh, you don't have to get hung up on it. So in some sense, I warn him that the notion of current time may be subtle. And OK, I realize that it's subtle. Uh, but I still came and hit him with this nice, simple, straightforward first sentence. Uh, tell you in advance, they aren't all that good. Second one, partial correctness is a relation between, I'm, I'm going backwards in time, incidentally, uh, in these reports. Not right now. <laughs> Partial correctness is a relation between the program states before and after execution of the entire program. Now, I think that's OK. I mean, I would like something. I mean, I would be able to like to get, like to get a, something as good as Ginsburg could open it with, but uh, I'm not Ginsburg. This is straightforward, direct. I mean, there's no passive wimpiness in it. Um, 
moreover, it, it starts right in with the subject matter. There, there's no, um, you know, I'm going to show you that, or it's a very important problem that, you know, none of this nonsense. It's getting right down to business. It may not be great poetry, but uh, it's not bad. Here, next one. Over the past few years, I have developed an approach to the formal specification of concurrent systems that I now call the transition axiom method. Well, again, that's not Ginsburg or T.S. Eliot. But notice something about this. Notice very different style between this sentence and the other two. Well, if you have look through the rest of the paper, you will see that this paper is in a very different style from the others. Notice this chattiness. Over the past few years, I have developed. I'm not getting quite right into it. I'm not jumping down into something. I'm alerting the reader in some way to, to, to what's happening in this paper. And in fact, this paper, I believe, Don, you said that, that, that you would use that as an example. Ah, you have copied that. This is the simple approach to specifying concurrent systems. This is a chatty paper. It's a paper where I was writing, you know, not for the JACM audience, but for the datamation audience. Uh, not quite datamation, but almost that bad. It's submitted to communications of the ACM. Uh, so datamation prime. And I had my audience in mind right in the, at the first sentence. And it's not bad, not a bad sentence. Um, Well, let me go to, uh, to one that I, that, the one that I was ashamed to, to look back and see. The mutual exclusion problem, guaranteeing mutually exclusive access to a critical section among a number of competing processes, is well known, and many solutions have been published. That is a wimpy beginning. I do not like it, in retrospect. I don't know why I wrote it. Um, it doesn't grab the reader. It does tell him that, you know, that, yeah, this is about the mutual exclusion problem, but he could have gotten that from the, from the title, a fast mutual exclusion algorithm. And the writing isn't execrable. I mean, it doesn't have in, in, in uh, running after the other. But that doesn't do a very good job of grabbing the writer. So um, in, I will close by saying that uh, I'm not T.S. Eliot or Allen Ginsberg, I need to pay more attention to, to the way I write. And I think that applies to all of us. And I'm sorry that I don't have time for questions uh, for the TV audience, but I guess uh, if the people come storming in here uh, at uh, 1.15, so I guess I can answer questions off camera for five or 10 minutes if, if anybody has any. Um, I don't know if you want to leave the camera.